Open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And for those of you that struggle, that's right before 2 Thessalonians. <laughs> that helps you. This is a great chapter, and I want to go through it, and I want to talk about Liberty Fellowship. I'm not going to be mentioning the fellowship by name until later in the message, but I do want to talk about us. Now, I want to use this chapter as a foundation for the context of what I'm going to say. I've outlined the chapter beginning in verses 1 through 3, and I put the word affection next to these three verses. Affection. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, Silvanus was Silas. Paul and Silas, that was Silvanus, another name. Uh, of Silas. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you and that's the part that I've highlighted and that's the part I would like for you to underline in your Bible. We give thanks to God always for you. How many people do you know that you can always thank God for? Always thank God for. People will fool you. They'll be your friend for a few months, a couple of years. They can fool the pastor. They'll be faithful for a few months or a couple of years, whatever. We thank God always for you all. This church had a deep, affectionate meaning in the heart of, of Paul. Making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. And don't ever forget that everything you do for the Lord is seen by God. It may not be seen by the pastor. It may not be seen by the fellow congregants, your brothers and sisters. Your labor and your work for the Lord may not be seen by many other people. But there is not a single prayer you make, there's not a single act of goodness or of grace that you extend, there's not a single labor or work for the cause of Christ and righteousness that God does not see. He takes notes, he puts it in a record in heaven, and every work, in every labor that we have done for the Lord, he has put in his file system in heaven to be remembered whenever we stand before the Lord one day. Our affection and Paul's affection for the church in Thessalonica and our affection for our own fellowship and the people of it Unlike so many institutions that call themselves churches, it's not based on fluff. It's not based on emotion. It's not based on, uh, based on giddy feelings. It's not based on signs and wonders. But it's based on fidelity to truth, steadiness in the fight, and brotherhood during the storm. 
You'll find out who your brothers are when you're in the storm. You'll find out who your friends are when you're in the fight. Anybody can be your friend when it's easy to be your friend. But when people turn against you and the media is attacking you and other so-called conservatives are attacking you and Christians, quote, are attacking you, that's when you're going to find out who your real brothers and sisters are. That's when you find out who your real friends are. And that's what Paul was saying to the church at Thessalonica. I thank God always for you. They have stood the test of time, and they've stood the test of adversity, and they remain loyal and steadfast to the cause of Christ, to the preaching of Paul and Timothy and the others. And Paul was very affectionate in his greeting to this church. He did not address all of the other churches that we have in the Bible in this fashion. He didn't open the book of Corinthians in this fashion. There were many of the churches that Paul wrote to that he could not say what he said here to the church at Thessalonica. The affection that they had for Paul and for each other, which was based on truth it was based on commitment, based on a brotherhood of righteousness, etc., which Paul starts out saying, oh, how much I thank God for you always for the way you have stood by the truth. Number two, in verse four, I have the word election. Number one, affection. Number two, election. Verse 4, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. This is a doctrine that we cannot ignore. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Chosen in him before the foundation of the world. I know a lot of preachers that try to downplay the doctrine of election, which I think is a mistake, because it's absolutely clearly stated in the word of God that we are chosen in Christ. It's hard to explain this, this truth. It's hard to understand it. This is the best illustration I know to try and explain the doctrine of election. When we hear the message of salvation, we hear the gospel preached, we hear the word of God say to us, whosoever will, let him come. We say to ourselves, I'm a whosoever, and I will come to Christ. I choose to receive him as my Savior and my Lord. We walk through the door of salvation. The door closes behind us, as did the door on the ark. When we turn around and look at the door, it doesn't say, whosoever will, let him come. That's what it said on the outside of the door. On the inside of the door, it says, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. There's no question. We have been elected by God. So number one, affection. Number two, election. Number three, verses five and six, affliction. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, 
underline this next phrase. Having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Having received the word in much affliction. The idea that there's this seven year period of time in the future, which Christians aren't gonna be a part of anyway because they're raptured, in which there will be tribulation on the earth is a nonsensical doctrine. Every child of God of every period of human history and every location, every continent, every country is going to suffer persecution for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not suffering some form of persecution, then you're not a Christian. Because every child of God, a true believer, is going to suffer affliction and persecution. The Bible is replete with instructions to us that we with much tribulation shall enter into the kingdom of God. Our tribulation is not in the future way down the road and then at the last minute the seventh calvary is coming from heaven and take us out of it so we won't have to suffer persecution tell that to the christians today in communist china that the seventh calvary is going to come and they're going to escape tribulation Explain that to the Christians in Saudi Arabia. Explain that to the Christians in Israel. Explain that to the Christians in any country of the earth that has gone through severe, intense persecution for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs if you haven't already done it. Go back into the annals of church history and read about the persecutions from the Roman church and the inquisitions and the torture and the barbaric deaths in which the saints of God died for the cause of Christ. Tribulation and affliction will come upon anybody who is a true believer in Jesus Christ because Satan, who is the God of this world, hates anybody who belongs to Jesus Christ. When you got saved, the devil put an X mark on your back. And you've been a target of his ever since you came to know the Lord as your Savior. If you think you're going to serve Christ without doing battle with our enemy, Beelzebub, Satan, the god of this world, then you need to read your Bible and get caught up with the Christian life. This, these preachers, these prosperity preachers, are always presenting Christianity as if it's, you know, the, the greatest sales program ever invented. You're gonna get wealthy, you're gonna be healed, you're not gonna have any sickness. You're gonna have all kinds of wealth and money and, and all of the good things in life. Name it and claim it, brother. <laughs> they are not preaching the true gospel. They are preaching a phony gospel. Turn it off, turn it off. The true gospel says, take up your cross and follow me. Yes. Affliction. Having received the word in much affliction, our commitment 
friendship, dedication, etc., can only be proven through the test of adversity. Until you're willing to go through the fire with us and we see you in the fire, standing firm with a good heart towards God and your brothers and sisters, unwavering, unmovable in the work of the Lord, then we will know you are a real brother. You are a real sister. Until then, it's only talk. Anybody can talk the Christian life. But brother, whenever God puts the church through the fire of adversity, you'll find out that many in the flock are not really in the flock. And he will separate those who are phony from those who are genuine. And those who are of true faith will have that assurance during the test of the fire. Number four, in verses seven through nine, I have the word illustration. So that ye were, old English word, King James, in samples, synonym for example, to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, and underline this phrase, your faith to God word is spread abroad. Your faith is spread abroad. So that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. And now underline this last phrase. And how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Your faith is spread abroad. Well, what was part of that faith that was spread abroad? You turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And that testimony of the church of the Thessalonians was spread throughout the entire world at that time. In a message a few years ago, I preached on Christian idolatry. The Bible tells Christians, flee from idolatry. That's kind of a strange statement, isn't it? To Christian people, flee from idolatry. Well, you would think that if you're a Christian, you wouldn't have to be told that. Unfortunately, many Christians, or at least professing Christians, are as much idolaters are anybody in the pagan world. And in that message a few years ago, I talked about some of the idols of America's Christians. And one of those idols is the idol of money and materialism. There is no question about it. Many Christians going to church every Sunday, their God is not God, their God is mammon. And they're trying to use God to help them make more money. They're trying to use the church to help them make more money. They are using the church as a means of enriching themselves. And this, of course, is very true for many of these prosperity preachers. Now, there is certainly nothing wrong or sinful about a pastor being well taken care of by his congregation. In fact, it is a biblical requirement that the church care for their pastor in such a fashion. But that is a far cry from the name it and claim it prosperity theology heresy that is running rampant across America today. 
When Paul Crouch died in 2013, he left 13 mansions. 13, not houses, mansions. He left two private jets. One was worth $8 million. The other was worth $49 million. That was in 2013. He left a $100,000 mobile home for his wife Jan's two dogs. Jan Crouch had two dogs and those two pooches lived in a $100,000 mobile home just for the dogs. No human being in the place. This is the same man that I heard myself with my own ears on television say, quote, Jesus was the first communist and the early church was the first form of communism, close quote. That's what Paul Crouch said on international television. Where did he say that, you ask? I'm glad you did. In front of a bunch of communist leaders in Beijing, China. Donald Trump's former spiritual advisor, Paula White, I know it's, it's hard for me to say this and not laugh, so I understand. Paula White told her followers that if they wanted God to bless them, they would give her a month's income. That was the spiritual advisor to Donald Trump. If you want God to bless you, give me a month's income. How, think about how anybody has the gall, the, the audacity to stand in front of a live congregation and people watching by the millions online and say things like that. You have to be totally devoid of conscience. You have to have absolutely no heart whatsoever, so consumed with greed and lust for wealth that you could stand up with a straight face and say things like that to a congregation of people, many of whom are just barely keeping the lights on. People that are working two or three jobs just to pay the bills. People that are living in some of the most humble, modest dwellings. People that have some of the least of this world's goods. And you're going to stand up and have the audacity to tell them that the way, the only way God can bless them is for them to give you that are living in the lap of luxury a month of their income. The idol of politics and war. Many Christians in America today worship politics. They worship political parties. They worship political candidates. We've had people leave this congregation during the last administration because I told the truth about President Donald Trump, just like I tell the truth about Joe Biden and Barack Obama and George W. Bush. I'm not impressed 
with political label. I'm impressed with fidelity to the Constitution. <laughs> Had a, ran into a man, one of the men that left not too many weeks ago, out and about. And I didn't even recognize him, but he recognized me and called me and I talked, well, actually, he did all the talking. And he said, Pastor Chuck, just want you to know that we have nothing personally against you, blah, blah, blah. You know, we don't, we're not mad at you or anything like that. But he said, you know, it was just Donald Trump. We just, we just couldn't handle your criticism of Donald Trump. I didn't say anything because there was no need to. Cast not your pearl before the swine. But I thought to myself, yes, of course. And what I wanted to say was, of course, everybody knows that a politician is much more important than a truth-telling pastor. A lying politician is much more to be wanted than a truth, truthful pastor. Of course. A politician is more important than a pastor. Of course, you'd want to listen and show such great dedication, faithfulness, and fidelity to a lying <clears throat> politician than you would to have the courage to sit in a congregation and hear a man of God tell you the truth from the Word of God. And there are millions of Christians all over America that if their pastor would have said one word of criticism about of Donald Trump, they would have walked out just like that man did here at Liberty Fellowship. They worship politics. God is an afterthought. Church is an afterthought. Pastor is an afterthought. The Bible is an afterthought. They worship politicians and politics. And they worship war. Both parties in this country, in Washington, D.C., are complicit in creating an Orwellian surveillance state in America. In 2021, last year, a report just came out. The FBI surveilled over three million American citizens under the unconstitutional Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, reauthorized over and over again by both political parties in Washington, D.C. Three million American citizens who had done nothing wrong, no criminal activity, they weren't investigating crimes. They were just investigating American people. They don't even know they were in be that they were investigated. It could have been any one of us in this room. Any one of you watching online. We wouldn't even know that they were surveilling us. You won't even know that there's a file in the FBI office somewhere in Washington a computer with whatever information they chose to input. I'm probably mispronouncing this name. Those of you that are from San Diego, anybody close to San Diego, from San Diego? Close to San Diego? Is it, it's, it's not Chula Vista, is it? Is it Chula Vista? C-H, Chula? Okay, all right, I got it. In Chula Vista, California, a part of the San Diego Metroplex, approximately 300,000 people in that city. This report just came out. DHS partnered with a Chinese drone company to create the first totally surveilled city in America. A totally surveilled city, 300,000 people. From the moment 
anybody living in Chula Vista, California walks outside their front door, they are under government surveillance everywhere they go. That is the prototype for what they want to do all over the United States. This is just the test city. Chula Vista, California. Well, of course it would be in California. Where else would you start? A city of 300,000 people and every one of them under total government surveillance from the time they leave their front door until the time they walk in their front door. More costly wars. This is what I said several years ago. The military industrial complex that advocates that the U.S. remain at war year after year after year is the very entity that continues to profit from America's expanding military empire. Raytheon and Lockheed and the other military industrial giants are making multiple billions and billions of dollars right now on this war in Ukraine. Unheard of profits for many, many decades. Joe Biden and both parties, Mitch McConnell, Republican majority leader in the Senate, well, I guess he's not the majority leader, he's minority leader now, isn't he? Joe Biden and Mitch McConnell, both parties in D.C., are right now as we speak attempting to send an additional $40 billion to Ukraine, which would bring the total U.S. contributions to Ukraine to over $60 billion. Ladies and gentlemen, that is more than what Russia spends on its defense budget annually. 60 billion total, 40 billion right now. At the same time, the American people are laboring under the highest gas prices in history. Mr. Putin is not responsible for our high gas prices. The bozos in Washington, D.C. are responsible for the high gas prices. Don't ever forget that. And mothers are barely able to find baby formula for their little children right here in the United States. And they want to send $40 billion to Ukraine. While American babies and the mothers of those babies are fighting desperately just to find food to feed their babies. This is the United States of America. These politicians make me sick to my stomach. And I believe that God Almighty is just as nauseous as I am at the conduct of these traitors to the Constitution and to truth and liberty in this country. Right now, Rand Paul is standing all by himself in the U.S. Senate blocking the transfer of those $40 billion to Ukraine. Rand Paul. Senator Daines, where are you? I know you took a trip to Ukraine. Have you wondered about this? Has anybody thought about this? Am I the only one that thinks about this kind of stuff? I'm thinking to myself, you know, Macron, the guy from France, he took a trip to Kiev. Walked around, cameras, you know, and everybody. 
uh, Johnson from Great Britain, he took a trip to Ukraine, walked around. Steve Daines goes to Ukraine. What? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought there was a war going on in Ukraine between Russia and Ukraine. They're telling us how bad it is in Ukraine, how horrible it is in Ukraine. And yet all these politicians are just flying in commercial planes, flying into the airport, get out, walk around, TV crews, go eat, dine, wine, all the trimmings, all pat each other on the back, walk around. Where's the war, guys? Am I the only one who thinks about that? Say, wait a minute. If it's such a dangerous place to be, how are you going there and unmolested, untouched, all the cameras? I'm telling you, folks, we are being played. Yes, sir. Senator Daines, If you're not standing with Ron Paul against this $40 billion theft of the American people to that reprobate, bloodthirsty tyrant in Ukraine who is every bit as bad as Putin or worse, you have no right to be a representative of the people of the state of Montana. That was free. More political spectacles. I quote Attorney John Whitehead. Politics in America is a game, a joke, a hustle, a con, a distraction, a spectacle, a sport, and for many devout Americans, a religion. How about that? This is, a, this is a, a constitutional attorney. I know nothing about his faith. In other words, it's a sophisticated ruse aimed at keeping us divided and fighting over two parties whose priorities are mostly the same. Amen. Amen. John Whitehead. Ladies and gentlemen, God is using Liberty Fellowship as an illustration of a pastor and congregation committed to truth, resistant to political and religious correctness, and independent of religious denominational and governmental cronyism. God is using us as the great exception to what has happened to so-called religion in the United States. Do not think for one minute that we are not noticed. Do not think for one minute that the powers that be, the forces of evil, do not know who we are and where we are. Do not think for one minute there are, that there are not tens of thousands of people across the world, literally, and especially in America, who are given strength and hope and courage and faith in the times of which we live. Don't think for one minute that this fellowship is not making a difference in the lives of many, many thousands of people around the world. Which brings me to number five, and lastly, verse 10, anticipation. And to wait, underline that word wait, will you, in your Bible? And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Wait, wait. Wait. We are commanded to wait 
for his return. Christians, 80% of them in the United States, those are scientific survey numbers. That's just not hyperbole from this preacher. 80% of the evangelicals in this country have made an idol out of Israel-based prophecy in an attempt to help facilitate Christ's second coming. They truly believe that they are helping to bring Jesus back sooner by the way they support the Zionist state of Israel. Millions of Christians have given millions of dollars to Israel in order to help the Zionist state build a third Jewish temple. I have messages on the third Jewish temple. If you go to my Israel package set one, I have a message there specifically talking about that subject, they really believe that if they can help Israel build a third temple, which will be used for what? Should it be built? Which it won't. It won't be built. I'm telling you, it won't be built. God will not allow it to be built. In the past, Jews have tried to rebuild or rebuild the third Jewish temple back in the days of Hadrian, I believe it was, the Roman Empire. And I have in one of my messages in the Israel packages, I talk about how God intervened from heaven and wrecked the attempt to build the temple and killed a lot of the workers not, I'm not talking about war. I'm not talking about man retribution. I'm talking about divine retribution upon the people that were trying to build the third Jewish temple. He, he destroyed them from heaven, just like in Bible days. And there hasn't been an attempt since. And now they're talking about building the third temple. Won't happen. But they believe that it's got to happen so the Antichrist can come into the temple and can start animal sacrifices per the Old Testament. Have, are, are Christians so untaught yes they are why do I ask that they don't realize that Jesus death on the cross was the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament sacrifices and how it, Hebrews is so crystal clear that any attempt at sacrifice other than the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is to crucify Jesus a second time. Blasphemy. To offer a sacrifice when Jesus has already offered the supreme sacrifice for our sins. And Christians all over America are giving their hard-earned dollars to try to make that happen. Wait for the sun from heaven. Wait. Don't rush off and start fighting wars in the Middle East on behalf of a pagan Marxist Zionist state. Don't give millions of dollars to try to build another Jewish temple. Wait! Do you have a hard time understanding English? 
Wait! What does that mean? Wait! That's a command. Wait! For the return of Christ. 2017, Jim Baker, the good Christian preacher, crook, <laughs> thief, gangster, con man, Jim Baker and prophecy geek Tom Horn promoted a new book. This is 2017 that suggested that President Donald Trump was a modern-day John the Baptist for the Messiah's return. That the election of Trump signaled the coming of Christ. Of course, they referred to the rapture. He was the John the Baptist. This is in their book. They said, this is 2017, they said that Trump's election could be the precursor for Christ to return in September or October of 2017. September, October, 2017, Jesus was coming. Well, here we are. Again. 2021. Of course, when these people write this kind of junk and they sell millions of copies of books, make millions of dollars, and it's all wrong, every bit of it's wrong, then they'll come around a year or two later with another book and another date and another person and another event, and they'll use the scriptures all over again and sell a bunch of more books. And that goes on and on and on, and you would think that people sitting in these churches would come and think to themselves a little bit, wait a minute. Nothing these guys have said has come to pass. None of it is true. Why am I still attending this church? Oh, lie to me again, preacher. <laughs> lie to me again. Praise the Lord. 2017, Jesus is coming. Praise the Lord, 2019, Jesus is coming. Oh. Praise the Lord, 2020, Jesus is coming. Wait. Wait. You don't know when he's coming. I don't know when he's coming. Tom Horn doesn't know when he's coming. John Baker, Jim Baker doesn't know when he's coming. Nobody knows when he's coming. Wait. For the coming of Christ. That was a good chance right there for an applause. What happened to you all? Man. News flash. When Christ returns, he's not going to need anyone's help. Not Jim Baker, not Tom Horn, not Kenneth Copeland, not Jesse Duplantis. The guy who said... Well, he says to Jesse Duplantis, you're a millionaire, Jesse Duplantis says. And he told the story himself. Jesse Duplantis says, you're wrong. I'm not a millionaire. And the guy said, you're not. He said, no, I'm a multimillionaire. And he said, if you're not careful, I'll buy out your business and fire you. Jesse Duplantis, great preacher of the word. Now, I'm not a millionaire. I'm a multi-millionaire. 
If you're not careful, I'll buy out your business and fire you. And then he said, smiled and said, well, you know, that might have been a little fleshy, but it sure did feel good. And everybody laughed. Two Sundays from now, in case those of you who are listening were not with us at the beginning, May the 29th, which is a holiday weekend. And if you're able to travel, and I know travel is expensive now, but if you're able to travel and be here in person for this weekend on the 29th with the Memorial Day holiday on that Monday, we'd invite you to come. I'm going to be bringing my seventh prophecy message, which is entitled, When Did John Write the Book of Revelation? A lot of the erroneous interpretation of Revelation stems from the misdating of the writing of the book. And I believe I'm going to convince you from the scripture and from church history when John wrote the book of Revelation. And it's not what you have been told. And I'll say something else. Without Christians making an idol out of Israel, the cover-up of the attack on the USS Liberty would have never succeeded. It would have never succeeded. That's why I'm urging you again to get the book, Remember the Liberty, written by the survivors of the Liberty, including Ron Kukul, our dear friend in Wyoming, who was one of our fellowship family extended. He was one of the crew members that was here when we had the live service. We had that on DVD as well. The live service honoring the crew of the USS Liberty. If you don't have those, I know that inflation is killing all of us, but these materials are so valuable. I believe that they'll help you so much. I encourage you to get them. And so we are going to be bringing prophecy message number seven on May 29th, Memorial Day weekend, and I hope you'll come if you can. It is the pastors and the men of God in this country who are the ones charged with the responsibility of speaking truth to power, regardless of political party, of standing boldly and uncompromisingly for the biblical natural law principles of liberty, and of being honest truth seekers and truth tellers. That is our job. For far too long, churches and Christians have looked to politicians, to political parties, and to political celebrities to lead the country out of darkness. This they cannot do. Light and darkness are spiritual realities not political ones. Jesus said that his disciples were the light of the world, not the kings, not the governors, not the potentates, not the emperors, not the presidents. His disciples are the light of the world. As long as Christians are looking to politicians and are not looking to the men of God in the pulpits to give them the truth from the word of God there will be no deliverance from the melees that we are now in as a country our nation's ills are spiritual not political so why does the church look to the likes of these politicos to lead them out of darkness 
Maybe it's because all they see around them are pandering, pussyfooting, pharisaical preachers. And as a result, there's no confidence in the pulpit to direct the ship of state in the moral course it should take. And so they look to Fox News and the Republican Party to bring a spiritual deliverance that only God, through his preachers, can bring to this country. Then again, if people truly want truth-telling men of God to bring light to their country and communities, why do they continue to sit in the dark shadows of these pathetic pandering pulpits? If you really want light, why are you sitting in the shadows of these pathetic pandering preachers that are helping to cover the land in darkness? And I want to end by noticing again in verse 10 that Jesus is the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. Do you see that in verse 10? Which Jesus delivered us from the wrath to come. You're not going to be delivered from the wrath of God upon your sin except through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of your reformation, your church membership, your catechism, your good works, your baptism, your spiritual gifts will do nothing to deliver you from the wrath to come. And every soul who has not received the Lord Jesus Christ by faith is still walking in darkness, who's still walking in sin, and the judgment of God upon their sin is very much alive and real. And they will face the judgment of God in this life and the life to come. The only escape from the wrath to come, including eternal wrath, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He died for you shed his blood for you, took your place on the cross, vicariously, vicariously took our sins upon himself, paid the price for our sins, which is death and hell, rose from the dead victorious over our sin, and all who come to him by faith will have total and complete forgiveness and redemption of sin. If you look to Jesus for the redemption of your soul to escape the wrath to come in eternity, why in the world would you not look to Jesus to help us concerning the wrath to come in this life? Why would you do that? The same Jesus who is Lord over our hearts and over our souls is the same one who is the Lord of the universe, King of kings and Lord of lords. Nothing can happen without his permission. He is sovereign in this world. Ben Franklin nailed it. And Franklin was not known to be an ultra-spiritual individual. Franklin said, God governs in the affairs of men. And he does. So when we look at the affairs of men today, and we see the plight in which we live, should we not, as Christian men and women, should we not look beyond the politicians look beyond the problems, look beyond all of the, the mess and chaos that is being created all around us, a lot of it intentionally by evil, wicked men. Can we not 
look beyond that and recognize that there is a God in heaven that is still working in the affairs of men. And if God is allowing this to happen, should not that speak to our hearts spiritually? What part does the carnality, the unbelief, the wickedness, the lying, the gossiping, the backbiting, the cheating, the stealing, the pride, the ego of Christian people, of pastors, play in what God is allowed to happen in our country. In Old Testament Israel, God brought judgment on the nation through all kinds of political and pest pestilence and war and all these things. But he did that as a judgment on the men of God and the people of God who were not doing what they were supposed to be doing. If the people of God and if the pastors in America would start doing what they're supposed to, by, to be doing, I think this America that we live in would look entirely different. <laughs> he, Jesus, is the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. Let's stand for prayer. with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if there is one who is listening to me right now in this room or online who has never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I beg you to do so. I trust you will feel the call of the Holy Spirit on your heart, that you will see him as Savior and Lord, crucified buried, risen for you, and that by faith you will trust and receive him and him alone as your Savior. If there's any question about whether you've ever trusted Christ, then do it now. Trust the Lord from a sincere, honest heart, and he promised, he that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. It's not your baptism, your catechism, your church membership that's going to save you. It is faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. 